Good morning. Two weeks ago on Wednesday night at 6.30, I was Zooming with my Unity class in the middle of Hurricane Zeta before we got cut off. One of the members, a professor, told me that he sits in his car a few minutes every day when he arrives at his university and thanks God for his good fortune at arriving there safely. That was the good news, someone practicing gratefulness. The bad news was that apparently people noticed his moments of silence in the car each morning and asked him what he was doing. When he told them that he was being grateful, they thought this daily gratitude ritual was weird. Then there was last Monday. I asked my high school juniors who were reviewing the past tenses in French what they had done over the weekend. The good news was that their French grammar was more or less correct in their responses. The bad news to me was that none of them had gone to church, synagogue, or mosque. I've been reading in the ministerial news feeds about how many churches are closing all over the country because they don't have enough members, 3,000 churches a year, as a matter of fact, which is about 1% of the 300,000 or so American churches. A very knowledgeable friend of mine said to me recently that he thinks the reason for this is because some of the financial and moral corruption in the organized religions are just turning people off. Well, the good news is that people are not accepting these financial and moral misdeeds. The bad news is that many people are throwing out the baby with the dirty water. Just because some of the leaders have caused financial and moral scandals doesn't reflect nearly as much about their religion as it does about their unchecked human nature. Another reason given for the closing of churches is because many people no longer believe in the traditional fundamentalist Christian God, that anthropomorphic Methuselah-like figure with a beard sitting on a cloud judging us and punishing us all the time. Again, it's a case of throwing out the baby with the dirty water. To me, it's good news that people are maturing spiritually and no longer believe in a vengeful, man-like God figure. But why do they abandon religion or spirituality altogether? If you really think about it, this symbol of God is rather poetic. It's just limited, probably fine for children and people who can't think abstractly. It symbolizes much of what spirit or God is. Santa Claus may not be real in a sense, but he symbolizes the spirit of Christmas. So do we quit believing in the season of peace and joy and rebirth of the Christ consciousness in us just because its symbol doesn't really fly around with reindeer once a year? The divine level of life remains steadfast, even if its symbols change with time. More good news. For some 30 years now, I've been giving lectures about Buddhism and Hinduism to the senior humanities class at the school where I teach. This is good because these kids have open minds about spiritual ideas, and I have never had a parent complain. The bad news is that in the last 10 years or so, I realize how few students know anything about the spiritual path. I used to be able to compare Eastern spiritual paths with their own religions. Now, I find I have nothing to compare them to because most students know nothing about any of them. Most couldn't tell you one story from the Bible, and the Bible is the core teaching for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. I talk to teachers all over the country at public and private schools of all kinds, and this seems to be the prevailing phenomenon. I don't need to go into dozens of examples and statistics here. You all know very well what I'm talking about. My diagnosis of all this is that we are in the middle of a spiritual pandemic. We live in a secular society, and I think this spiritual pandemic has victimized far more people than COVID-19. There are more casualties. Many people are suffering. As this spiritual pandemic spreads, so does the fallout from it. Far too many have made gods out of power and money, and this doesn't make them happy. Now, 
This is not a new phenomenon. Historically, there have always been spiritual ebbs and flows in various civilizations. One thing that usually follows this spiritual pandemic is the downfall of that civilization. Societies become so rudderless that they disintegrate or get folded into another culture. The gods of power and money, instead of the basic eternal laws of unity, love, and peace, generally backfire eventually. For example, look at Bernie Madoff, flying high for a while and then crashing in jail, his beloved son dead from suicide, his devoted wife humiliated and bereft. Might makes right for a while, then it all implodes. These civilizations become so materialistic and divided that it's more or less every man for himself and their lack of unity makes it easy to take them over, which was the case with the classic story of the Israelites in the Bible. When the spiritual values diverge too far from the eternal values of the universe, there is a correction, kind of like corrections in the stock market when things get too out of whack and inflated. The market corrects itself. The biblical history of the Israelites who lost their spiritual values is very relevant to us. Its meaning is timeless. They became materialistic. They started intermarrying with the faithless. Metaphysically, their marrying the faithless or marrying outside their faith means that they became one with outside influences that weren't spiritual, and soon the Israelites lost everything. The moral of the story is very current, as is the case with all biblical stories, if understood correctly. The very values which build a civilization and make it strong must be maintained, in God we trust, for example. When higher values are not maintained, there is usually a correction. Now, many people see corrections in the stock market and civilizations as bad. Temporarily, in a materialistic sense, I can see that, but it can also be seen as good. There's a correction from illusion to reality before it's too late. Many people say that's what's going on now with the spiritual pandemic. When too many people make gods out of money and power and resort to any means to get it, they are violating the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Most scholars say that this spiritual pandemic started about 300 years ago with the age of enlightenment. It became smart to doubt anything that couldn't be proven in a lab. I agree that it's always better to replace superstition with fact, but inner science, psychology, and wisdom are also basic facts of the universe. Some people have jumped on the age of reason bandwagon because they view themselves as smart. Others just don't think for themselves. They will blindly follow the herd, just like the German people blindly followed Hitler. Many people think that the spiritual pandemic happened because the media has so much influence on us that we're being totally manipulated by multi-million dollar power structures, like advertising firms and political parties of one kind or another. We think we've got to buy or be this or that to be happy. Often, the opposite is true. We waste our time and money, but we don't find happiness. So, as spiritual people trying to survive in a secular world during this spiritual pandemic, what can we do? The good news is we can do a lot. First of all, we must look long and hard at the condition of those who are spiritually bereft. Are they happy? Look at the statistics in our country. Look at how many people are addicted to alcohol and drugs. They're overextended economically. They're depressed, lonely. Look at the suicide rate. I think we're in the middle of a spiritual pandemic, but I also think we've gotten to the point where a correction can take place. And that is the reason I'm talking about this today. The very good news is that I think you and I can play a huge part in this correction of our spiritual pandemic. The good news is that there's a breakdown of some of these weak points in our society. This correction can get us back on track to a more realistic place where everyone can thrive. 
Many say that this breakdown is actually making a space for something greater. It's the time when we can truly birth a greater reality in ourselves and in our world. Call it the age of Aquarius, the new model of the universe, or getting to the A point or tipping point. It's the breakdown of the weak points of the old norms and the recreation of true spiritual values, just like a correction in the stock market. It usually makes things more realistic. It might look bad to some people temporarily, but in the long run, it can preserve what is higher, a more realistic and workable reality. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For example, the breakdown of fundamental religions might actually make possible more spirituality. At least there won't be inquisitions, witch burnings, and religious terrorism. So, what does all this mean for you, this spiritual pandemic? As much as I would love it, I don't think Americans in the near future will stop everything and bow down to pray five times a day like Muslims do. I don't see our shop owners burning incense on their altars in the stores all day like the Buddhists and Hindus do. I do, however, have hope that people like you and me will accept the challenge of eradicating this spiritual pandemic so that we as individuals and as a country and as a world can survive. How? By helping to plant spiritual seeds in the gardens, the lives of our friends, families, and associates. They are hungry for it. People want role models. We can do this by personally modeling peace, unity, and love, and by living the eternal values of the universe, walking the talk, so to speak. We have here at Unity what most churches talk about, diversity, peace, and unity, and a belief in prosperity of all kinds. We can begin to help the victims of this spiritual pandemic by modeling good behavior, unity, joy, and love. This is the ultimate community service. Many people out there are worshiping false gods, the gods of materialism, social media, escapism, and illusions of all kinds, and they are suffering. They need our help. They're hungry for hope and guidance. When the Dalai Lama came to New Orleans a few years ago, there were 20,000 plus people at the UNO arena. They wanted a role model. They wanted wisdom. And you know the first thing the Dalai Lama said when he walked out on the stage? He looked so perplexed out there at all those people in fanfare. And he said, I just ordinary person, me no different from you, me no different from you. Jesus said the same thing. These things that I do, ye shall do also. The truly great spiritual leaders don't want to be worshipped. They want us to be like they are. They want us to set the examples and guide and love and have compassion for each other. Many want spiritual guidance. They just don't know where to go or how to get it. And that's where you come in. You all are the perfect ones to share your vast spiritual tools. This is the ultimate community service, spiritual food that can revive people and change their lives. You can do this by modeling healthy living, loving living, compassionate living, living with understanding about why people sometimes are the way they are. We can help cure this spiritual pandemic, at least in our immediate milieu. Then those with whom we share this wisdom and, lo and love will be able to pay it forward until there is finally a tipping point. And at that point, the masses will follow. The masses always follow the majority. It's the herd instinct calculus. We don't have a large enough congregation right now to engage in a massive soup kitchen or to be a homeless shelter. But we do need to tithe to the world. And what you have that few do is spiritual tools to help people survive. 
the eternal tools or laws of the universe that in all times and in all places have always worked. And like all tithing, the more you give, the more you receive. It truly is better to give than to receive, psychologically, spiritually, socially, and in terms of your health. Actually, you will benefit the most, you personally, but that's just Lanyat. You can help every person you encounter by modeling these eternal laws. That's what they need. So how do you model these teachings? We talked about that last week. One key to living a spiritual life is total acceptance of yourself and others, understanding that under it all is our divinity. Another key is self-discipline. This involves loving yourself enough not to make bad choices which sabotage your life and create chaos. A good basic guide to good behavior is society's laws. Maybe you don't agree with some, but most of them help things run more smoothly, like red lights, which regulate traffic so we can all get where we're going quicker and more safely. Actually, obeying laws can be a spiritual practice. Every time you obey a law, don't think about the law. Try thinking to yourself, I am not forfeiting my freedom. I'm going to use obeying this law to remind myself to subdue my ego and practice turning myself over to something higher. This is good practice for turning yourself over to God and higher laws. The civil law itself is actually irrelevant, but using it to practice subjugating your ego is a golden opportunity, and it's a way to start using all of life as a spiritual practice. Another structure worthy of adhering to is simply Moses' Ten Commandments. You might say, well, those are rather out of date. They're 3,500 years old. My retort to that is Moses was the first person with a tablet downloading data from the cloud. I read that on a t-shirt this week. These Ten Commandments, when understood rightly, as Katrina explained a few weeks ago, are a universal blueprint for behavior that works for the doer. They are a succinct way to avoid chaos, time, and suffering. Another way to model spiritual behavior might be an exercise like refraining from gossiping in words or thoughts. Not judging is hard to do without a change of consciousness. We must keep reminding ourselves that we are all at different places on the spiritual path. So some people might do or say things we dislike. Maybe they differ with us politically. But understanding that they are divine helps us not judge them. We often murder with our words and thoughts. Usually the people we gossip about and judge are just at a different place on the path to enlightenment. If we are brutally honest with ourselves, we'll be able to see the same things in ourselves. What I'm saying here is that we all want world peace and an end to the spiritual pandemic so that we'll be happier. And the only way we'll ever have it is to start with ourselves. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Just as the spiritual pandemic has spread, so can love, compassion, understanding, and a feeling of unity among all people. They're contagious too. And you whom I'm looking at right now are great potential leaders. You are very evolved. You have the wisdom, the tools, and the spiritual dedication to help your friends and associates. The Lord's Prayer says, Give us this day our daily bread. You've been given this spiritual bread. Share it with others. It's the ultimate tithing. I'd like to share some of my favorite quotes pertaining to these ideas about living in unity, love, and peace. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, In the end, we are all one world, and that which injures any one of us injures all of us. An anonymous quote that ran across my desk this week was, 
To be kind is more important than to be right. Many times what people need is not a brilliant mind that speaks, but a special heart that listens. Empathy is the most important leadership skill needed today. I think that is particularly true in this time of political disagreement. Maybe we think our political ideas about various issues or people are right, but unity with and loving the other person trumps any political issue. Another relevant quote about being judgmental is, every angel has a past, every sinner has a future. Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And there is the unity quote that says, we don't see things as they are, but as we are. The spiritual pandemic that we seem to be living in has reached a point where I think a whole new reality can develop. We've gone about as far as we can as a materialistic secular society. It isn't working, but there is a new reality developing. Increasingly, people are caring about unity, the environment, and less materialistic values. I think this is the time to take a stance and stand up for what we believe in. Model it. Share it. Live it every moment. Share peace, love, wisdom, and purity. You all know how, and you have the wisdom. Pay it forward. Maybe you have to keep your physical masks on during this time of COVID-19, but it's time to unveil yourself spiritually and share what you are with others. I guess the real challenge is just to remember to keep living it on a daily basis and remember that world peace that we so want begins in each individual's heart. During this COVID pandemic time, we may have to wait for a cure or an inoculation for COVID, but you are the cure of the spiritual pandemic. You are first responders because you have the tools to deal with the problem. You have what it takes to be real leaders in this regard. You are like spiritual Navy SEALs. You've been trained for this and you know how to survive. I encourage you to tithe to the world in this way so that we can deal with this spiritual pandemic. Pay it forward, live what you know, you know how to live. Love, understand, compassion, self-discipline, prayer, meditation. Be the role model that the world needs. And always remember to let go and let God guide you. You don't have to do this alone. You can change the world one person at a time, starting with you, being kinder, gentler, and more understanding. And I guarantee that if you do share and model your spiritual tools, you will be happier. And you will add to the peace and joy of the world. What a wonderful aim for this coming holiday season. Peace and joy on earth.